you don't have some pictures. It's so nice. It's yeah. It's like a little fancy. Makes me sad. Yeah. Or like yeah. walking in and seeing a bunch of people in suits. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, so here's the skin. Just so you can
Turn off your volume. Just Jordan and have it but it's gonna echo because yeah, exactly. But in but when the volume is like we'll just all turn our volume off for the entire presentation. It's like a microphone. So that should work. Yeah. So you can hear me right now. Like sitting in the room. Speakers, everyone. If you guys put a headphones on, can you hear me through Zoom? Yeah, you were coming through the Zoom. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. All right, you guys. So really quick for those of you who joined, um, here's the run through of the schedule. So you should pull up your laptops now and log into Zoom, which is in the website. Um, so that you can answer questions as they come up after your presentation, but you're going to give your presentation up front here. So log into the zoom and turn off your volume and mute yourself and make sure that your video is off. Um, you'll see in this schedule that we have for most of you, we have part, your partner or a faculty member to provide a reflection. So if your partner is joining via Zoom to save time, it'd be great for you to briefly introduce them. Sidoni, Tara, and Jordan, your partners were not able to join because of time differences. So you have slides in there. So to avoid you having to think yourself, um, I'll come up and I'll read it so that you don't have to talk about all the wonderful things that like you are doing. Um, so all of that for you, but for everyone else, I'll have you introduce your, your partner. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe what we'll do is shift that one to the very end. Hey guys, hey, we'll shift the planet women to the very end. So Stella is reflecting on both of your, your projects. Get bumped up there. Yeah. Sitting somewhere. Yes, please sit in the back and pull up your computer, log in the Zoom. Oh, that's <laughs> your volume and your mic. Should I run home again? <laughs> you can borrow. I brought two. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Grassless, 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 grassless. There was someone. Grasslands. I don't want to talk. What can I say? It's fine. I don't really have time. I don't really have time to actually. Running to a concert presentation with a chechka isn't. I'm only able to talk about that in seconds. Okay. So I think it's okay. We do. Yeah, man. It's basically just like grasslands are important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sorry, the frazzle to stay dry. Lovely. This is like, ready? I look so awesome. Look, look how many frazzles. Look at all those. Okay, moving on. So, um, <laughs> I ran out so, of time. So, 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 the hope of birth, which is not actually about birth, it's about the hope of birth. Uh, <laughs> may we wish for birth. <laughs> what if no one comes? Just us. That would be five and just don't don't accept them. She just no. Like my favorite shop. Speak of the devil. <laughs> I was just saying there are no posters, and then here they are. Yeah. No, you're calling me. No. <laughs> I haven't turned your grade in yet. What? I said I haven't turned your grade in yet. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
right before you all what are your presentations today i told him i zoom calls one of your students and she was raving about your class Oh, Start making your way up here so you can jump right in. Your laptop should be on mute and your camera should be off and your volume should be off the entire time. You guys are going to be presented in ways, obviously. Are we good to sit here or is there somewhere you to sit just to make it? Oh, we're fine. As long as you can make your way around. <laughs> Everybody have a schedule? Seems like we're just missing. Yeah, do you guys mind helping me with the page? I think you can just cut them up. Just like in there. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. They don't need a stand. Well, no, I did not People can't talk to me. Just like, I know what everyone's left. I like sprinted out of my house. Walk around the room. Before we get the email to I thought <laughs> 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 So, Rod and John, I printed off the run a show for you both. Put one on my chair in that corner. Um, 
After each presentation, the partner will be either so you might have to just use yeah. uh -huh. and she like okay. she's making the zoom link in my um uh, email or the email it's also on here are you gonna save us? Yeah. 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 so it's like come to reference yeah. She's doing, she made like her and like, she's like, her, I guess, like, film project, like a movie about like people. So I told her to come to the house. I think we I told her to talk to you too. She's like, oh, she's not. Yeah, but now that I've noticed it, I'm going to be It's like, I think it's like a bigger scholarship. You want to make me a co host? Yeah. The other way around. Now I'm mad at myself. I know. Now my whole throw it in the trash. I know, absolutely. Bundle to you. Just throw it in the trap can. I'll bring it half over now. <laughs> and the, in, in the, I made a mistake. We haven't seen it all that. None of that. <laughs> we kind of we moved up a row, separate from the back at least. Put that one in the window. No, I think about it. I said, I was in the star in front of a glass. They were literally on our desk, and then they don't know. Yeah. I don't think I've ever been inside of these before. Why would I come here? I don't know. I don't I do I <laughs> everybody, anybody have any questions about the flow? Oh, yeah, I got it. Amelia? So, after we present, uh, like, we'll just come back to our computers and we'll just on Zoom. Exactly. <laughs> okay. um, so, so, we will start to quickly running through the whole run of show. Um, it is at three o'clock. On the dot, we're going to start. So I'm going to start by welcoming everybody. I'll give the Zoom audience and in person audience a run through the schedule. <coughs> and we'll also give everybody instructions for QA. So the Zoom audience will be asking you all questions using the QA on Zoom. The in person audience are going to they're going to hold their questions. And at the very end, you all will your posters. And the in person audience will have an opportunity to come ask you your questions then. So then we'll start. And so you all have seen your schedule. We'll go through this order. We'll each give your five minute presentation. Please try to stick to that five minute time period. Um, I'll be sitting right over here and I can all be watching the time. If it seems like you're, if you've gone over the five minutes, I'm going to give you a, a thumbs up, which means wrap it up. <laughs> Um, in a really positive way, um, when you <laughs> wrap it up, then you will have a, we'll have a reflection from each of your conservation partners or a faculty mentor. Some of them are joining via Zoom, some were not able to join us, so they are provided a brief reflection, so there's a slide in the PowerPoint. So to save time, instead of me going back and forth and introducing everybody, I would love for you to introduce your partner if they're joining via Zoom. So Emilio, when you wrap up, you'll say, now I'd like to turn it over to Brad Pickens. 
who's joining via Zoom to provide a brief reflection. When, when Brad's done, I'll jump in and introduce Jordan. For those of you whose partners are not joining via Zoom, I will thank you. I will read their thank you so you don't have to awkwardly thank yourself. <laughs> um, so that's true for Jordan and Tara and um, Sidoni. Um, and I think that's it. Everybody else's partner is going to be joining. Um, for Anne and Sophie, uh, Sophie, you're going to go first, but we'll invite Stella to provide a reflection after Anne goes. So right after you're done, Sophie, we'll go straight over to Anne. And then when you're done, Anne, um, we'll welcome Stella to provide a brief reflection. Uh, same for you, Neil. When, you, when you're done, we're going to go straight to Madeline. Madeline, when you're done, you'll welcome Margarita, who will provide a brief reflection for both of you. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions? So you should be logged into Zoom. Make sure you keep your video off, your mic off, and please turn off your, turn your volume down, um, or mute your computers all together so we don't have an echo. Sure. Anybody have any questions? Erica sent it out in the real today. How are we gonna go? Is someone gonna be clicking? Oh, thank you. Okay. Good question. So I've compiled all of your slides into one very long PowerPoint that's up here. And so you should be navigating through your own slides up here. So I got them all in order. So you'll be going through your own slides. And would you prefer if I went in this direction or around? <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Any questions? Can you all hear me through Zoom clearly, or should I turn up the volume? Sorry. Can you hear me? Where's the microphone? Where's the microphone? We know where it is. Question. I think it's that thing hanging off. Oh, that's a cord. Never mind. Someone's <laughs> not muted. Yes. So unmute yourself. I was making sure. So don't do that. If you hear that, check your check your computer. Really quickly, since wait, does anybody have any other questions? And then otherwise, I for opportunity, sort of the calm before the storm. I wanted to give you a chance to meet a few new IAC team does anybody have any questions about the flow? Okay, before we start, hey, Kensei and Joe, do you mind introducing yourselves briefly to everybody? So we have Kensei, who is a new program assistant in the IIC. She's been helping with, she's going to be helping with social media and marketing and communications. And then we have Joe Baca, who's helping us with events, as you see, actively. Do you guys mind introducing yourselves really quickly? Uh, sure. So my name is Tensei. Um, I'm a junior majoring in econ. Um, yeah, also if like one or maybe three people could like stay behind and do like a quick little video about your research. It's like super quick, but just let me know if you guys are willing. But that's all about it. Hello, I'm Joe. Uh, I am a junior. Educational um, <coughs> psychology. Um, if you guys have any questions about the flow of events or anything like that, just let me know. I don't know if you had a chance to meet Alia Fernanda. Do you guys mind introducing yourself? You probably haven't. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Fernando Galeana. I am an assistant professor in the Institute for Internet Conservation and also in Psychology. <laughs> I'm currently teaching a class on environmental justice, and next semester I'll be teaching political ecology of conservation and research design in sociology. And I also plan to be teaching courses in international development. Do you mind introducing yourself? I don't know if you have all that. Some of you at the Open House. I'm Ali Sabo. I'm over at the IIC working on the conservation project. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Hi. 
I took the car for the first time and it was a hard. Uh, and I see you and some of you already know I'm happy to be here. I'm new faculty at the Institute for Integrative Conservation and my home department is in anthropology. And I'm teaching now conservation ethics, teaching in the next semester indigenous voices in conservation and environmental anthropology. I'm very interested. Well, unlike you all, none of us like to sit together. Robin John, is there anything else before we begin? Anything we haven't thought of? I think you thought of everything. That's so weird. We thought of everything. Anybody have any other questions? Can I put somebody in charge of briefing? Um, uh, Eileen, when she arrives. It's a question, Erika. Oh, sorry, Mary, have you have a question? Um, oh, sorry, you can. You're all just very eager to brief Eileen. I'll brief Eileen. You have a class. If you're going to be joining us at late, later. I saw your hand first. Wherever she sits. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wherever she sits, you can. So after my presentation, yeah. That stops it. Very well. <laughs> and after the uh, here we go. Something else came to mind. So well, I was just wondering how many people are you expecting? Really? Uh, so, I didn't get the actual estimate, but it was like 30 or 40. I'm not going to like advertise it, but if someone reaches out, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about it. Not the email. Maybe, yeah. Still, Mr. Jim. Julie and I are being Jasmine and Aladdin. Everyone's on the It'll probably be done by the so I'm drinking Gatorade right now. <laughs> That's what I did. Electrolytes. I had like a dinner breakfast. I called my dad. I was like, I just so badly hope I'm right. Don't worry. I'm like, and this like, I don't think it went from well to be honest. That's okay. You all are seeing on the Zoom, you're seeing the room, right? You're seeing me. Do you have a cost? Well, it's a shared screen. So we're seeing. I got it. That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
All right, we're going to go ahead and start. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Erica Grude, and I'm the program manager for the Institute for Integrative Conservation at William & Mary. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Student Conservation Research Presentations. Before we begin, uh, we would like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. And we are presenting these presentations today. This includes the Charanhaka Nadawe, Chickahominy, the Eastern Chickahominy, the Mattapanai, the Monacan, Nansimund, Nadawe, Pamunkey, Tarwomek, Upper Mattapanai, and the Rappahannock tribes. We pay our respect to their tribal members, past and present. As global environmental change and species loss accelerates, there's an urgent need to bring together a diverse community who can integrate expertise from across disciplines, sectors, and knowledge systems to develop innovative and integrative solution, solutions to the world's most pressing conservation challenges. William & Mary's Institute for Integrative Conservation <coughs> mission is to cultivate an inclusive community of creative leaders to deliver these innovative solutions to these pressing challenges. We achieve this mission by bringing together global expertise, diverse pr perspectives, and an entrepreneurial mindset to address emerging issues in a rapidly changing international environment. In close collaboration with all the schools and departments across William & Mary, as well as with conservation non-governmental organizations, uh, federal, state, and local agencies, international and tribal governments, universities, private corporations, indigenous peoples, and local communities, we aim to inter integrate expertise from across discipline sectors and knowledge systems to advance conservation in Virginia and across the globe. We also achieve this mission by strengthening the connections among people, communities, and nature to prepare the next generation of bold, compassionate, and principled conservationists to, who, will, who are prepared to adapt and respond quickly to challenges as they arrive. Today, you'll hear from 16 of these amazing conservation leaders. The IIC's year-long conservation research program, which is supported by the IIC and the Charles Center, brings together these, an interdisciplinary team of William Mary undergraduate students, faculty, and conservation partners to conduct research designed to meet uh, an applied need identified by the external conservation partner. As you'll learn about today, each of these projects was designed to advance real world conservation outcomes, but also to give these students an opportunity to build up their professional and research skills that will make them effective conservation leaders. Before we begin, I would like to thank all the conservation partners and faculty mentors involved in this program in 2021 for all the time and support they provided to these students and for your partnership. I'd also like to thank the members of the IIC team, as well as our advisory board, our steering committee, and our student leadership council for all of your support. Most importantly, I'd like to thank the 16 students um, who are here today, who you will be impressed by today, for all the enthusiasm, enthusiasm, time, and hard work that you put into these projects this last year. You give us hope for the future and have demonstrated really what it means to be compassionate and dedicated young conservation leaders. Today's event will include 16 five minute presentations by the students in this program. Each presentation will be followed by a short reflection from a conservation partner or faculty mentor if they were able to join us today. They're all over the world. For, so for some people, um, they provided a brief reflection. Um, we have both a Zoom audience and an in-person audience joining us today. We ask all Zoom attendees to please keep your mics and videos off uh, throughout the presentation. The event will be recorded and uploaded on the IIC's YouTube page. Because we have so many presentations, um, we'll not be having a Q&A after each session. Instead, we'd like the Zoom audiences to ask their questions on the Q&A feature, and the students will answer those questions after they finish their presentation. The in-person audience will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Emilio Luis Rica. All right, great. Thanks, Erica. So my name is Emilio, and I'm a junior at William Mary. I'm majoring in data science. And for this past year, I've been working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Geological Survey 
uh, to streamline the mining process for sandal cranes using deep learning. So uh, jumping right into it, um, what is this kind of conservation context, uh, this conservation problem that I've been attacking? Uh, every spring, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service collects a population estimate uh, for the mid-continent population of sandal cranes. Um, and they do this on this kind of key stopover point on the spring migration path uh, of the cranes. Uh, and this is in uh, on the Platte River of Nebraska. And then with this population estimate every year, they can uh, make decisions about uh, regulating hunting and then generally inform decisions to ensure that the population level for the mid-continent population is staying uh, reasonably stable. Um, how have they been collecting this population estimate? They've been using an aerial transect methodology. Uh, sounds complicated. It is kind of complicated, but not too complicated. Uh, basically, we have uh, observers aboard a plane uh, looking out the windows at a predefined distance with binoculars and estimating the cranes that they see. And then we have the plane flying along these predefined paths called transects, uh, and that ensures that we're getting a, a particular sample size. Um, why do we want a new approach? Uh, a few downsides for the previous approach. The biggest one is it is immensely laborious to perform these surveys, and they're performed every year. Um, I have one flight line, uh, which is even just a portion of the kind of sample region that we're going to be flying over. And I've zoomed way, way in, and you can finally see sandal cranes. They're those little teeny dots. Um, they're extremely dense, and they're very small in comparison to the region that we're surveying. So it is an immense amount of effort to perform these every year and to do it manually. Also, also um, a big issue uh, from the perspective of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are these kind of unacceptable sources of error. One of the big ones being we have to perform these surveys during the day. And during the day, uh, sandal cranes are dispersed. They're not necessarily congregating on the plat. And so we may not be seeing kind of the sample size that we expect if we just fly uh, a particular uh, region. Um, so moving to, towards a new methodology, uh, we'll collect images of the cranes and then count after the fact both in, in an automated fashion. Um, and so a big plus there is that we can move uh, towards uh, day, uh, nighttime surveys uh, instead where we will collect the imagery with high resolution thermal sensors. Uh, and then uh, we can guarantee that the cranes will be congregating on the plat because they roost at night and they are relatively immobile. Also, um, of course, the, the nicest thing is that we reduce the human labor involved in the process uh, because we're automating the counting rather than having humans manually produce the counts. Um, so there are two methods uh, for producing these automated counts. Uh, the first kind of portion of the process is producing learning materials for the two algorithms. So we pulled out 40 images, annotated every crane we saw in those images using a, a bounding box. So we drew a box around every crane in the image, and that kind of constituted our uh, full data set for training and evaluation. Then we chose two deep learning algorithms. One is faster RCNN, which you can see the outputs from the model up on the top is an object detection model, and it learns to match those, uh, those bounding box inputs, right? So we gave it uh, these annotated bounding box around each crane, and it learns to match that by also drawing bounding boxes. And if we want to extract a count, we just count the number of predicted bounding, uh, bounding boxes in the output. The second method is a density estimation method. Um, so the first step is to translate our annotated bounding boxes to this continuous density. And then we have the model, uh, the model match that uh, match that. The model is called ASPDNet. And um, the motivation for trying out a density estimation method is that in general, uh, in the general kind of deep learning object counting literature, uh, these density estimation models generally do better than object detection. Um, and so we'd like to see if that holds true in this conservation task as well. So results, we can look at results from a qualitative or a quantitative perspective. From the quantitative perspective, we don't have a fantastic baseline for the previous methodology's error, but from estimates from uh, experts in the field, it looks like both models have error that is competitive with the previous methodology. So that's what we'd like to see. They're uh, about as accurate or more accurate. But uh, a, a big thing here is we can look at these kind of qualitative measures for uh, performance and so I pulled out um, five different interesting scenarios. So you can see on the top row, the input uh, for that scenario, um, and then the two model outputs. 
So on this far column, I have ideal conditions. Uh, this is kind of the easiest scenario for the models. And uh, luckily we see that both of them do pretty well. So there are 177 cranes in that input and the object detection method predicts 163. The density estimation method predicts 174. They both do pretty well in ideal conditions. That would, that's what we would like to see. If we move over to one of those more adverse conditions, right? So I have four adverse conditions, birds on land, dense birds, birds in flight and ambiguous birds. Um, one particular one that is uh, really of interest because it is pretty common is this dense birds uh, scenario. And we see that the object detection method really struggles, whereas the density estimation method on the bottom uh, still does pretty well. And that is indicative of a trend in the data set as a whole, that the density estimation method uh, is generally more robust to these adverse conditions than the object detection method. That's exciting because the density estimation method is kind of the more uh, state of the art, the newer, the newer model. Uh, and so it's exciting to see that result, in, in, even in this kind of messy uh, applied task. So thinking about uh, where this brings us for the future, um, the goal is to uh, ideally implement this new automated counting procedure as soon as possible. Uh, whether that means phasing out the old procedure and phasing this in over time, uh, who knows, but ideally it goes into practice because we, you know, every year we are producing these uh, spring estimates uh, and, and it is an immense amount of effort. We'd like to alleviate that effort as soon as possible. And that all goes towards the major goal of being able to monitor sample cranes farther into the future and doing that efficiently so that we can uh, maintain kind of a stable population level within North America. Uh, more generally, aerial imagery is really easy to collect, but there's this huge bottleneck at the uh, analysis stage, um, especially if that analysis component is manual. So if we can work towards a general framework for implementing these deep learning methods to produce <coughs> automated counts, uh, then we can essentially do our monitoring strategies better. Um, and then more generally, that leaves room to uh, potentially monitor more species. We may not have to pick and choose quite as much uh, because we're more efficiently using our human resources. And that's kind of a big overarching goal of this research, but also uh, other kind of parallel uh, studies <coughs> that have used similar techniques. So really quickly, I got to thank my partners at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey. The team has provided so much um, fantastic mentorship. And of course, also the members of the Institute for Integrative Conservation who have given me feedback throughout my uh, faculty mentor, Rob. And um, now I'm going to hand it over to Brad, who is a, a member of the team. He's from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and he's going to uh, just say a few words about the project. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Emilio. Uh, can you all hear me okay? All right. Um, so I know uh, Mark Conniff really wanted to be here today and Brian Lubinsky as well. Hold on, hold on a um, second, Brad. Oh. And testing, can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you fine if, if that helps you at all. Like what sound is? I think you you were talking and we couldn't hear anything in the room. So, so, okay. Uh, and we're okay. going to try and fix that in the room for the future present. Just but that was fantastic. Thank you for supporting it. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody try it. <coughs> you have to listen to it. Okay. Perfect. Sorry. Thank well, you, thank you so much, Amelia. Oh. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Um, next up, we have Jordan Bryant. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jordan Bryan, as Erica just said. And for the last year or so, I have been working with the Mongolian Conservation Initiative, as well as the IIC 
to do a long-term vegetation analysis in Iknart Nature Reserve in Mongolia. And so as part of this project, we were interested in exploring how vegetation has changed over the last 18 years within the nature reserve, as well as what biophysical variables might be affecting that change. And so you're probably wondering why we are even interested in these vegetation changes in the first place. And there's actually a few interesting reasons for this. First of all, Mongolia is home to some of the largest intact grassland ecosystems anywhere in the world. And so we're interested in preserving the biodiversity that, are, that exists within these grassland ecosystems. For one, um, Argali sheep, Siberian ibex, as well as vulture species and a whole host of other threatened and endangered species rely on these grasslands for their habitat, as well as to graze in many cases. And so we wanna understand how this vegetation is changing in order to better conserve these particular species. And in addition to that, the grassland ecosystems are also home to nomadic herding families who have existed within Mongolia for thousands of years and rely on the grasslands in order to preserve their livelihoods um, and graze their livestock within the park. However, what we've been seeing recently is an increase in grassland degradation within the country. So about 70% of all pasture land in Mongolia currently is rated as degraded. And this coupled with an increase in the number of livestock recently, as well as an increase in frequency and severity of drought um, due to climate change has increased both researchers and nomadic herding families' concerns about the vegetation status within the park and in, within Mongolia as a whole. And so we are interested in exploring these changes and how, what different variables might be affecting these changes that we're seeing. And so over the last 18 years, researchers in ICNARD, as well as volunteers, have been collecting vegetation data from 36 different plots within the park. And they were sampling for a variety of different factors, but most pertinent to my project were the total percent cover of that vegetation within each one of those plots, as well as the number of vegetation species that exist within each one of those plots as a proxy for plant diversity. And so at the beginning of my project, the first thing that we wanted to look at was the trends in vegetation that we were seeing throughout that 18 year period. And so the first thing that we looked at were the number of vegetation species within each one of those plots throughout the time period. So as you can see in this graph, each one of these lines represents a distinct plot that was sampled throughout that 18 year period. And there's definitely some differences um, between the years, ups and downs in the number of vegetation species that we were seeing. But I really want to point out the year 2008. We see a really big decrease in the number of vegetation species in that particular year. And then later on between 2012 and like 2016, we're also seeing a decrease in the number of vegetation species relative to the years before and after that. So I just want you guys to hold on to those years in your head for a second. Um, and I'm going to get into why we might be seeing those decreases a little bit later. So the next thing that we looked at was the change in percent vegetation cover in each one of those plots throughout the same time period. And as you can see, there's a little bit of a difference in um, each one of the plots in the same years. There's more variation. However, what you see is that at the beginning, we're seeing a little bit higher of a vegetation cover. And then later on in later years, we're seeing a decrease in the total vegetation cover in those same plots. But again, in 2008, we see a pretty big decrease in the percent vegetation cover. Um, so we had those trends in mind and we were curious what biophysical variables might be affecting those trends that we saw. And so here are some of the things that we looked at. First, we wanted to see how livestock numbers correlated to those trends, as well as the drought severity in index, which is basically quantifying how dry a certain year was. And then we also looked at the proximity to wells and springs, herding gears, and major roads to see if there's an increase in vegetation disturbance in those particular areas. And in order to do this, I ran a generalized linear model for each one of these um, to see which one of these factors best correlated to the vegetation trends that we are seeing. And in the end, what we found was that livestock number and the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is the drought ind index that we decided to use, were the factors that best correlated to the changes in vegetation that we are seeing. So if you remember what I was saying earlier about particularly 2008, what you can actually see here in the Palmer Drought Severity Index is that 2008 was the driest year in this period of time. And so we can kind of start correlating that with the changes in vegetation that we are seeing. And then again, in 2015, we see a dip in the drought severity index, again, meaning a drier year. And we also remember seeing earlier in the vegetation trends that there was a dip in those years in those vegetation trends as well. And then as you look at the livestock numbers, 2008, we're starting to see a steady increase in the livestock numbers. 
And then 2015, where we saw that other dip, we're starting to get to the highest livestock numbers that the park has ever seen. So now we understand better what vegetation trends we're seeing within the park and what biophysical variables might be affecting those trends that we're seeing. But how is this in any way correlated to real world conservation goals? Well, in 2022, I will be presenting these results to the rangeland management planning meeting so that nomadic herding families, as well as park rangers and researchers can better understand the trends that we're seeing and what might be affecting them in order to determine what kind of land management strategies they want to use in the future to best weigh the interests of the biodiversity, as well as the nomadic herding families' livelihoods within the park. Well, thank you, Jordan. So it's 3 a.m. in Mongolia. So they actually sent um, a brief reflection on how Jordan's work um, aligns with uh, their conservation priorities. So I'm going to read that for them. We, the staff of the Mongolian Conser Conservation Initiative, have been very grateful to work with Jordan on this important project. It's been an absolutely fantastic experience. We have great field researchers there in Mongolia, and they've been collecting this long-term data set over the last 18 years. However, in general, there's a gap for abilities to analyze this data and are always looking for opportunities to collaborate with various partners and students. Thus, Jordan's help was incredibly valuable. We plan to start management actions based on her results and, and recommendations. We greatly appreciate this applied and integrative conservation science component by William and Mary, and it will be followed by science-based protected area management actions in Mongolia. Thank you to Jordan and to William and Mary. Thank you. Happy to introduce um, and this will be followed by Ann Turner, and then we'll have a reflection uh, from Planet Room and after these two complimentary uh, presentations. Sophie. Hi, everyone. My name is Sophie Pitaluga, and I'm a junior head in college. And uh, this past year, I had the privilege of researching gender and conservation with like I was saying, Planet Women, this NGO based on Dr. John Swaddle. So I kind of wanted to start with a little bit of a story, um, because if you if you would believe it or not, about 90% of fisheries around the world are either overexploited or exploited at capacity. And so what does gender have to do with that? Well, women account for about 50% of fishery staff members, which is a large number, and yet they are excluded in the industry and especially at leadership at the leadership level. And so while they're not necessarily dominant in the fishing part of the cycle, they help out with cleaning, processing, and selling seafood, keeping the industry afloat. So believe it or not, about 60 to 70 percent of conservation scientists identify as male and 92 percent of them are white. So this shows a distinct lack of representation of women and women of women of color, excuse me. Um, and this is especially apparent at the leadership level. And we know that exclusion won't lead to great conservation work because diversity and inclusion facilitate creativity and innovation, which is what we desperately need in conservation. And while progress is taking place, we need to see more gender mainstreaming, more intersectionality, and a commitment from leadership. And so my three main research objectives were to investigate some of the inequities that exist with a specific focus on Black, Indigenous, and people of color who identify as women, and then also making the business case as to why increased gender diversity is good for conservation um, through a series of case studies, looking at a series of case studies. And then finally, I wanted to recommend some actionable steps that individuals in conservation, as well as conservation organizations, can take to advance intersectional gender equity in the field. And this was done through a series of interviews and literature reviews. And so I wanted to share a couple of the recommendations I've been working on. The first one is changing the organizational culture or the fabric of an organization in order to make people feel more welcomed, valued and included in the organization's work, because we know that when people feel included, they do better work, they perform better, and they're happier. And so this kind of starts with leading with some shared company values where people from the leadership all the way down to the employees are working towards a common goal and feel fulfilled in doing so. Also employing a growth mindset where mistakes are seen not as failures, but as opportunities for growth and learning is really important and should be especially reflected by the leadership so that people at the employee level feel supported by that. 
And then finally, also rallying together and in, rallying together an organization and engaging in collective action to advance and integrate intersectional gender diversity, equity, inclusion is really important in trying to mainstream some of these efforts. And then at the more individual level, I focused on looking at accountability, evaluation, and transparency. So I developed this employee evaluation form, which is this internal assessment that employees can take to evaluate peers, management, and leadership. And I thought this was a good way of anonymously assessing people's thoughts about and feelings about working in a certain environment, and also a good way for people to express maybe some places where the organization can improve. Um, and this is all also really important for transparency and accountability of the organization as a whole and also for individuals within the organization. Um, additionally, it's really important that organizations are sharing statistics and metrics, especially as a way to monitor progress. Um, and this is especially relevant when we're talking about the gender wage gap. In fact, a lot of scholars will say that Transparency is one of the most important factors in closing the gendered wage gap, which is a huge issue. And so what's next? Well, hopefully this project will add to the existing research on gender and conservation. And with my recommendations, I'm hoping that practitioners will have something to kind of look towards um, when they're trying to hasten the speed of working towards intersectional gender equity. And once the paper is written, I plan on sharing it with the people who I interviewed over the summer, um, as well as reaching out to some conservation organizations to let them know what I've been up to this past year. And all in all, I really hope that this is just another wake up call that we really need gender equity in order to better address conservation issues because time is running out, which is not what people like to hear, but it's kind of the truth. Um, so thank you all for listening to me today. And I wanted to shout out again, Planet Women and the entire IIC team for this opportunity. We have Ann Turner. Hi, I'm Ann Turner, and I'm the co-producer of the second season of the Conservation Stories podcast. And additionally, I am a double major in biology and environmental science, and I will be graduating this spring. And so Trailblazing Women in Conservation is the title of the second season, and this season explores topics related to gender equity within the conservation field. And before I get started, I would like to thank my mentor, Dorothy Ibez, the team at Planet Woman and the IIC for their insight and support. So why did we choose the topic of gender equity? Well, we chose this topic because we wanted to contribute to the ongoing conversation about equity by elevating the voices of women because diverse teams will increase the e efficacy of conservation initiatives. And additionally, gender equality is considered a human right by the United Nations, but unfortunately, some workplaces are still falling short of this. And this can be seen through a Colorado State University study, which interviewed 56 women leaders in conservation, and every single one of them reported experiencing gender-related issues within their career. And the vast majority of them had encountered issues in four out of the six categories, which were studied. And these categories were salary inequity, formal exclusion, informal exclusion, harassment and inadequate organizational response, assumptions of inadequacy, and assumptions of wrongness. And additionally, women are generally underrepresented in most sectors and at hierarchical levels. And specific to conservation, only 30% of the conservation profession identifies as female, and this is even less for women of color. And the gender disparity is also leading to the loss of important voices in conservation discussion because women use the value and understand nature differently than men. So when we have a bunch of different people coming to the table to talk about conservation, workplace diversity has been proven to enhance these scientific and conservation outcomes. And that's why this topic is so important, because the more voices that exist, the more holistically an issue can be addressed. And additionally, workplace diversity will increase happiness, profits, and productivity of an organization. 
And so podcasts are a really accessible way to disseminate information. So for the past year and many, many rounds of editing, I've been working to create the second season of the Conservation Stories podcast. And the goal of this season is to raise awareness for the need of gender equity and to promote actions that will break down these barriers within the field. And there was a previous season that came before me and the tagline that came along with that is conservation stories wanting to connect listeners to nature through inspirational personal narratives from diverse voices in conservation. And the target audience for the podcast is students and of course the broader conservation community, especially re um, leaders who can break down barriers and increase diversity within their organizations. And so for the featured guests, each episode is around 20 to 35 minutes long, and it highlights a women from a different facet of conservation to include a range of voices. And so to get this range of voices, we wanted to talk to someone across the range of conservation. So we interviewed someone at the CEO level, which is Jill Tiefenthaler, the CEO of National Geographic, Nicole Usters, who is a project manager at Conservation International, and Christine Wilkinson, who is a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley. And so what topics did we discuss during this podcast? So to facilitate these interviews, me and Professor Ethos came up with a list of eight main questions to ask each interviewee, and do that a couple of these topics arose. And so some of these topics were talking about imposter syndrome, how to navigate gender inequities in conservation, the intersection of gender biases or racial inequities, the benefits of mentorship, and tips for success just in the field. Might be missing a slide, but thank you guys so much for listening. And up here is the QR code that will take you to the podcast homepage. So if you go ahead and scan that, it'll pull up the podcast and it is also streaming on all major platforms, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Thank you. Turn it over to Sela Martinez of Planet Women. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sela Martinez, the CEO of Planet Women. And on behalf of our team, it's been a pleasure working with Sophie and Anne this year. Planet Women's mission is to partner with women to create a healthy planet for the benefit of all. Sophie and Anne's research is impacting Planet Women as a new startup organization. It's exciting to see their generation uncover systemic problems and describe them in new ways. They are connecting across generations to people older than them. This is life affirming and, and, and inspiring and we are so pleased to be working with them. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Anne and Sophie. Next we have Patty Bear. All right, hello everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about my project that I've worked on with the American Bird Conservancy and the IIC, where we have used LIDAR to detect changes in grassland vegetation before and after restoration. So as Jordan has already lightly touched on, grasslands are a very important ecosystem type. As you can see from this map, grasslands actually cover a large percentage of the United States. <coughs> But compared to that large percentage, they are very under-researched and understudied. So something very important about grasslands is heterogeneity. As you can see from this picture, there is a wide variety of grass heights and grass species, as well as some shrubs and some trees that should be present on a grassland landscape. Unfortunately, without proper management, you get woody vegetation encroachment where more shrubs and more trees are present and this inhibits the ability for grasslands to function as they should. Grasslands serve as an incredibly important ecosystem and habitat for many species, including these lovely birds, the bobwhite quail, which are an iconic species in uh, Texas and Oklahoma grasslands. 
Now with proper management, grasslands can become the suitable habitat once again, and that is where the Grassland Restoration Incentive Program comes in. So this program, also called GRIP, is jointly run through the American Bird Conservancy and covers Texas and Oklahoma privately owned grasslands. They employ seven different restoration techniques, including prescribed fire, which is pictured here. Um, and I focused on the circled in northern Texas. So GRIP is doing a lot of really important restoration work, but unfortunately, there is no monitoring program in place. So it is unclear what the actual effects on the landscape have been in the long term. And that is where I have come in. Um, so through my project, I have tried to create a grassland monitoring protocol that uses remote sensing. So we explored a variety of remote sensing data types and landed on LIDAR. LIDAR is a point-based data type that can be used to create elevation maps easily, which is what we did. And I analyzed LIDAR um, from a sample group project that I selected, and I understood the changes made to the landscape in that context. So how I did this, I found publicly available LIDAR from before restoration and after restoration. I then analyzed that to create a digital surface model and a digital elevation model. I then used those two to create vegetation height maps. I then binned that data into four different height classes based on ecological knowledge of the area. And then I exported those maps and ran different landscape ecology metrics to kind of understand what was actually happening in the ecosystem. So these are the maps that I came up with. Uh, you will see a pre-restoration and a post-restoration map. That center zone is where the treatment actually happened. And in this case, this was a prescribed fire site. So that center area of the map was burned and the buffer area control area on the outside was not. Um, as you can see before restoration, there's a lot of that dark green, which is the woody vegetation that we are trying to get rid of so that these grasses can flourish and we get a better habitat for species. And if you look on the right, after restoration, we did just that. Um, there's a lot less dark green and more space for grasses. And then when I ran landscape ecology metrics on these maps, uh, I found a 20% decrease in woody vegetation, which is showing that this habitat is going in the right direction. So what does this all mean? It means that in this specific instance, the restoration project worked, which is fantastic. And on a broader scale, it means that LIDAR can be used to assess grasslands, which is something that is not typically done. There's not a literature, a ton of literature that's available on it as of now. And it also means that landscape ecology can be an interesting lens to view grasslands in the future. It's something else that's not typically being done at the moment, um, but it's really important when conducting restoration and conservation work to understand your outcomes in context and using landscape ecology helps to understand what is actually happening on the ground in those grasslands. So thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to Anna, who is my partner at the American Bird Conservancy. Hi, can y'all hear me this time in the classroom there? Yep. Awesome. So this is Anna Matthews um, from over at American Bird Conservancy and Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture. Uh, I just want to say this was an absolutely great experience, and I think I learned just as much from Maddie and going through this process with the IIC as hopefully Maddie learned um, from all of us and doing this project <laughs> itself. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to see kind of where we're going to go with this methodology that Maddie developed and how we can use it to kind of change how we evaluate our projects and maybe um, incorporate LIDAR into um, our partnerships with other agencies organizations as well. Um, and I'm just really excited to see that something like the IIC exists. Um, migratory bird joint ventures are all about partnerships and collaboration. So it's great to see such an amazing example of uh, a university doing that. So thanks. And on to the <laughs> Uh, my name is Hannah. Um, I'm a biology major at the college. And let's try something, whether you're on Zoom or in the classroom. Um, please raise your hand if on an average day, or if you're on Zoom, you can just pretend. 
Um, raise your hand if on an average day you're thinking about birds. <laughs> Biased room. Um, please raise your hand if you're ever thinking about birds dying by colliding with your windows. So this is a biased room, but I bet if you were in a normal room, there would be fewer hands. Um, so this is basically what I got to do my, pro ooh, my project about. Um, before I switch the slide, I want to tell you guys a sad fact um, that about or almost 1 billion birds die every year by glass collisions. Um, and this has become such a problem since 1970 that we have had bird populations that have not been able to sustain those losses. And there have been 2.9 billion birds just gone that haven't been able to come back, um, which is kind of insane. And over half of these collisions are occurring at low rise and residential buildings, meaning your own homes or if you live in an apartment building or just wherever. Um, and so it's not very good. Um, and as the title of my presentation suggested, um, go ahead and pull out your phones. If it's near you, just kind of look at it. Um, you use your phone for lots of things like checking the weather, the news, social media, but what about conservation? Can you do that? Some of you, this is a biased room, <laughs> not all of you. Um, and so what can we do about that? My research this year focused on um, how we can integrate the average homeowner or renter or apartment dweller, wherever you live, um, into preventing and mitigating these collisions um, with an app. And so while this app isn't out yet, we hope that in the future it will um, give you all the answers that you might need to prevent those things from happening, which is very, very cool. So some of the things I did was I looked up a lot of papers. I went and looked at the Fatal Light Awareness Program in Canada, their website, or FLAP, also the American Bird Conservancy's website. I looked at what kinds of mitigation strategies they were recommending, and also just what was helpful and what wasn't. And then after that, I was just kind of thinking, why are some people so motivated to adopt these mitigation strategies to prevent collisions? And why are some people still so reluctant to do it? Um, and so I sent out a survey um, to 749 people that responded. So thank you to some of you in this room who did that. Um, and then analyzed that on some Excel sheets. And then these are a couple of the stats that we found um, of the people who had already adopted some sort of mitigation strategy over 91%. So almost all of them said that their number one motivation was just contributing to bird conservation, that they wanted to do that and they were able to do that. Um, and that's very, very interesting because they cared presumably because they knew about the issue. Um, the other side of this is that everyone that we surveyed that had not done anything, um, put up anything on their windows to prevent collisions, over half of them said that their number one barrier was that they had never thought about this before. They had no idea it existed and they didn't know where to start. Um, and so that's just kind of crazy, right? If you know about an issue, you likely will care about it more. But if you don't know, you can't care. And if you don't care, you're obviously not going to do anything about it. So this is what the app is for. My job has been finding these types of answers so that I can compile a list of recommendations for the app to get people rolling on this issue and also get them educated. Um, and so besides my job of finding those answers, compiling the lists and giving them to us fish and wildlife, the next steps, because this app won't be in the app store for probably some time, um, but keep your eye out. Um, the next steps will be an in-depth literature review um, on the effectiveness of some of those strategies and what kinds of ones we should actually include in the app, um, as well as research on popular apps that you already use, like why do you like to use them, and then asking people to try out beta versions of the app and seeing what they think um, in terms of its structure and functionality. And so for my last point, it's very encouraging to know that conservation works and that we've seen bird populations bounce back um, from conservation efforts like the one Maddie was just talking about. But it's even more exciting to know that everyone in this room and on this Zoom and that you know your grandparents, just like the average people that like looking at birds, can be a part of this work. 
like you don't have to be like in conservation research to work in conservation. So that's very, very cool. Um, I'd like to thank Joel and Eric from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as John, etc. Um, and then I would also like to welcome Joel on the Zoom. <laughs> Joel is muted right now. Oh, poor Joel. Joel, you're muted. <laughs> All right. Well, lost her. She just dropped out. Um, She's still there. <laughs> at the top, but I can't hear. We love technical difficulties. I know. They're our favorite. Well, can you hear us? Yes. All right. Well, if she comes back in, we'll make sure to send it over to her. Good job, Alex. Next up, we have Allison. People cannot be called to action without a clear understanding of where to begin. Hello everyone, my name is Allison Walsh and my project with the IIC and the William & Mary Office of Sustainability was to develop a sustainability toolkit for the William & Mary community. Currently, William & Mary has a strong university level sustainability plan, but many times campus units, which refers to offices and departments, don't really know their role within the plan or what exactly they can do to help achieve university goals as well as their own goals. So the objectives of my project were to operationalize the current sustainability plan and create a prototype of the William & Mary Sustainability Toolkit to beta test on the IIC. So how I went about this um, creating my framework for the toolkit was mainly researching other institutions green office programs which is common for businesses and other universities. I also did look at other sustainability toolkits, but first of all, sustainability toolkits are not very widespread yet. And also a lot of the ones that I found weren't as much of an interactive process as we wanted it to be. But one resource that was very helpful for me was Penn State's sustainability planning guidebook. I also interviewed personnel from SWEM libraries, procurement facilities, and the wellness center to ask them questions about what they think the barriers and motivations are to making sustainable changes within their units. I also beta tested the self-assessment, which I'll talk about on the next slide, on four William & Mary personnel. So the toolkit is made up of five steps, the first step being the self-assessment that I just mentioned, and this sustainability assessment is done on Qualtrics by one representative of each unit. And the survey is made up of prompts that are separated into four categories, academics and curriculum, campus culture, operations, and administration and planning. And at the end of the survey, the representative will get a score report that includes a total score that corresponds to one of four levels, as well as scores within each of the four categories so that they can see which areas they're strongest and in which areas they need improvement. Once they obtain the score report, they're ready to establish priorities using the sustainability SWOT analysis. And the SWOT analysis kind of synthesizes the score report that they just obtained by asking them questions such as what their strengths were, what their weaknesses were, um, what were possible barriers, um, what are opportunities for change, what their priorities are, and possible actions they can take. Now that they have their priorities, they can move on to step three, which kind of turns those priorities into solidified tangible goals um, using the green goals diagram, which splits their goals into long term and short term so that they have more of a timeline going forward. Once they've developed their goals, they need to know exactly what they're going to do to achieve these goals. So that brings them to step four, which is identifying behavior changes 
And the main focus of this step is to get units to brainstorm what their unique role is um, for sustainability on campus and how they can um, come up with innovative <coughs> initiatives to achieve the goals they just set in step three. Um, but I have also provided them a recommendations catalog if they need some ideas. And the catalog is a document of ideas for sustainable changes and initiatives they can implement um, split into the levels that they got in the self-assessment. And then within each level, it's split into the four categories I mentioned. The last step is execution using the implementation checklist. And the checklist kind of just puts everything that they've done in the last four steps together, such as asking them if they have goals with corresponding actions, what are the timelines for those actions, what are the metrics for success, will, how will they share progress updates with each other and with the rest of the community. Currently, we are beta testing the toolkit on the IIC. This began on October 20th, and I've already gotten some great feedback that will be really helpful for when I generate recommendations for a rollout plan and future iterations of the toolkit for the IIC and the Office of Sustainability at the end of the semester. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I'd also like to thank all of these people. Um, and I would like to introduce Calandra Waters Lake, my conservation partner, for a brief reflection. Thanks, Allison. Um, hopefully you all can hear me. Um, <laughs> my name is Calandra Waterslake. I'm the Sustainability Director here at Women Mary. Allison has done an outstanding job on a project that really required a lot of creativity and stakeholder engagement and a ton of flexibility. Um, not only does this toolkit help us meet a goal set in the William & Mary Sustainability Plan, but it's going to help offices and departments work towards other university sustainability commitments. Collaborating with the IIC on this toolkit has been great, and I'm excited to see them beta test it and what we can learn from that. So a big thanks to Allison for all the hard work. What you've created is really going to be useful. Next up, we have Sidoni Horn. Hello, my name is Sidoni Horn, and this past year I've been working with Wildlife Conservation Society in Mongolia to research the effects of public policy on land cover change outside Bokhan Ul Special Protected Area um, near Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. So first, understanding how policy and human development impacts protected natural areas is essential as more of the population moves into urban areas. By 2050, 70% of the global population is expected to live in urban areas, which means there will probably be, probably be more development in those areas, and it's important to understand the side effects of that on protected natural areas. PKU is a good study location for a few reasons. First, it's the oldest governmentally protected area in the world, and it's close proximity to the rapidly expanding Ulaanbaatar, which is an ideal study location for how <coughs> urbanization is affecting these protected areas. Additionally, the um, urbanization in Ulaanbaatar has started mainly in 1990 and has rapidly progressed to the present day. So we'll be able to look at this over a shorter time period and see how rapid changes in policies are reflected in land cover. We have two objectives. To calculate the change in land cover percentage within each zone of CKU and to explore the correlation between land cover change and public policy. A brief explanation on the zones you're seeing. Special protected area is the highest level of protection in Mongolia. And within that, it's further broken down into three groups based on what you can do in those areas. Pristine zone is the uh, most limited. You can only do non-invasive observational research all the way out to the limited use zone where some level of development is allowed generally for tourism purposes. Um, Anudari and I, uh, my partner at WCS, chose to add a one kilometer buffer to the outside to look at what urbanization was happening on the uh, edge zone of the park. We answered our question in two parts. First, through a GIS analysis involving remote sensing. We looked at uh, satellite images and classified them into five land cover categories. And we're then able to compare those different 
those land cover categories from different time periods to create maps showing change um, in each area. We also looked at public policy data and uh, changes <coughs> in leadership over the study period and created a timeline that compared the changes to the map. I'm gonna quickly go through these. We have six time periods, basically on a five year increments. And these are all focused on the northern edge of the park near Lombatar, which you can see in the top corner. Um, on the right are some of the policy that I pulled out to that seemed like it might be having an effect on the changes seen. Everywhere in red is where grassland has become urban, uh, which is the main uh, change of focus. And you can kind of see that most of the development we're seeing has been in the last, a lot of it has been in the last uh, 10 years right outside of Uwambatar in the Northern Slopes. One reason for this in our initial review is that um, around in 2010, Mongolia eliminated their methodology for assessing economic uh, and ecological damages <coughs> in the greatest land use change. When you go back to this picture of the different zones, you can see that the urbanization almost perfectly fills in the limited use zone near Uwambatar, which has interesting um, suggestions about how policy is followed in urbanizing areas. And through this project, we really want to put it forward to policymakers in Mongolia and around the park so that they, they, they so that they can see how their policy is protecting this public protected area. And if these are the changes that they want to be seeing as they uh, make economic decisions as well. The next step is to write up a final report, um, quantifying our findings and explore uh, further statistical analysis and more in-depth comparison with the public policy data. And we are also going to look at the different applications of the data um, within Mongolia. I'd like to thank um, everyone at WCS and the IAC, and especially Anudari, uh, who is a grad student at the National University of Mongolia we work together on every step of this project. Four AM in Mongolia. So Kirk Olson from Wildlife Conservation Society Mongolia program sent this, and I will read it for him. The results from the work that these two highly promising conservation GIS professionals have carried out will help will help shed light around urban development pressures in Mongolia, how they've impacted protectory management. The importance of protection of access to public spaces and areas set aside for conservation are not only currently appreciated in Mongolia, especially in areas where development pressures are high. Prior to this work, the flow of degradation loss of habitat around both ponds stri strictly protected area, one of the oldest in the world, had always been discussed as problematic, but there had never been an attempt to quantify this degradation and visualize the process. The analysis that Sidoni and Anandari uh, conducted allows for open and informed dialogue around these issues and allows public participation in how public spaces are managed. In hope that this will then lead to greater appreciation and protection of these spaces that are both important for biodiversity, but also the public health of a large urban population through access to open and wild spaces. Thank you for your hard work. Good job, Sidney. Uh, to now invite Hello everyone, my name is Tara Vassan, and I'm excited to present to you today my conservation research project, which focuses on education as a powerful tool, a powerful connector that bridges learning gaps between people, places, and things, and also highlights the narratives and experiences of indigenous communities, namely the Marubo tribe, which resides in the Javari Valley in the Amazon rainforest. <coughs> I'd like to begin by giving you all a statistic. Indigenous peoples make up less than 4% of the global population, yet they nurture and manage <coughs> over 80% of the world's biodiversity on their own. <coughs> but despite their invaluable contributions, they are facing a slew of threats that endanger their survival on a daily basis. Some of these include deforestation, encroachment, mining and mineral extraction, <coughs> lack of adequate health care, and above all, a removal of their natural rights to their land. And simply put, if they are forcibly removed from their land, there is no one to protect the Amazon rainforest. And it therefore falls victim to deforestation, 
um, development and destruction. And without the Amazon rainforest, which is a globally shared and globally important research uh, resource, sorry, for us all, life as we know it is irreversibly and irreparably damaged. And so to prevent that, Beto Marubo, a representative of the Marubo tribe and also a powerful advocate for indigenous rights, is on a mission to tell the story of his people, one, of sto one story of struggle and survival with the rest of the world in the hopes that we may gain a better understanding of how to stand in solidarity with the Marubo, Marubo tribe and how to support them uh, in their fight um, for their home. And so, Unfortunately, there is a severe lack of, of representation of indigenous perspectives and voices in educational curriculum. And so we believe that education be, can be harnessed and it is a powerful tool that can combat forces of oppression, ignorance, inertia, and negligence. And so we've created a curriculum um, to teach nine to 12 year old kids, which is a group of of people that have enormous learning potential to grasp some of these issues from the perspectives and experiences and stories of the Marubo tribe. Some of the key themes and principles that guide our project are empathetic storytelling, active listening, <coughs> gratitude, and something called kinship ecology, which is the fundamental belief that humans are a part of the environment rather than apart from the environment. And we hope that these key principles really give shape and form to our curriculum and inspire <laughs> kids to learn about conservation based on the experiences and narratives of the Marubo tribe in the Javari Valley. So this is all a tall order. And so let me break it down for you. We have eight lessons that focus on things that we like to call the key connectors. And these connectors are sort of like the binding agents that tie the web of life together. And we've identified them as community, food, air and water, biodiversity, and healthcare. Each lesson explores a key connector and has engaging media and activities that challenge students to think about conservation on a visceral, visual, audible, and tactile level so that they really may gain a strong understanding and a st strong grasp of interconnectedness. Here's a little sneak peek of what our curriculum will look like. And one of the uh, one of the goals for our curriculum was to, again, inspire rather than intimidate students. And so we wanted to present information in a way that was informal yet informative. And so we have a one page review of all the material that you need to know for that lesson. And our vision is that it could be applicable and accessible to everyone, no matter what sort of educational environment you're in, traditional, non-traditional, whether you're a parent teaching your child, whether you're an educator teaching a student, whether you are a camp counselor uh, teaching a kid at camp, we want you to be able to access this curriculum and use it to the best of your ability in whatever capacity to leverage storytelling and empathetic and active listening to make a difference. And so I'm excited to share some next steps for this project. We are actually piloting a prototype of this curriculum next week to a group of kids. Fingers crossed um, that they like it because that is the ultimate test of whether our efforts have been successful. And so we continue, um, we will rely on student feedback, but also the feedback from indigenous experts, from educators, um, and of course from Beto Marubo himself to rework to revise, to improve, enhance, and strengthen our curriculum so that come spring, we are able to share the story of the Marubo tribe with the world. And um, by working on this project, I've come to really understand and appreciate how education is a tool, a connector, an interconnectedness machine that really um, helps students take charge, but also take care of their future for us all, looking back to the Maruba tribe as a prime example of that. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Sarah. That was fantastic. Um, so Celine Cousteau is the main conservation partner. Um, not able to join us uh, because of the time difference, but I'm going to read this on behalf of partners and then welcome Professor Lanouette to provide a brief reflection. Um, so on behalf of the mentors um, who have been working closely with Tara, I'd like to say that Tara has done a fantastic job of creating innovative and creative curriculum that inspires nine to 12 year olds to embark on a meaningful exploration of the interconnectedness, both in their own local community and the global community, and specifically their connections of Arubo tribe. Tara has brought enthusiasm, creativity, and a commitment to understanding the stories that Beto and the rest of his community would like shared um, in this project. She's shown a commitment to active listening and to learning throughout the process of developing this curriculum. And this, as Tara says, is the first step in the process of co-designing curriculum. And Tara's work is certainly going to make a difference. So thank you for everything that you've done. Um, Professor Lanouette, do you want to provide a brief reflection? Hi, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to add that Tara has brought an artistic and creative effort to curriculum design. We're really working in a really cutting edge space of trying to imagine particular ages, context, geography, uh, and it's done a fantastic job weaving together all these different elements into the curriculum design. Hi everyone, as Eric just said, my name is Christina Sapochik, and I'm so excited to share my project with you all, um, for which I partner with Conservation International, the William and Mary Center for Geospatial Analysis, and the IIC to look at Indigenous peoples and local communities, as well as ecosystem services. So for a little bit of an introduction, ecosystem services, or ESs, are goods and functions that ecosystems provide for people. This can be water, food, and multitude of other resources you might think of. All people need these to, in some capacity, but they're currently very much threatened by biodiversity and ecosystem loss, as well as other environmental issues. So it's clear that we really need to protect areas that are providing these services for us. That's where Indigenous peoples and local communities, or IPLCs, come in. IPLCs steward approximately 50 to 60% of lands globally, and these lands are often very important because they're biodiverse places and there's less deforestation and less land degradation in these areas. So in order to make sure that these lands are still being managed properly, it's really important to improve the legal definition of IPLC rights. My project is combining each of these issues or topics ecosystem services and IPLCs to look at how they're spatially related and where overlap exists between them. So my project objectives center around my main question, which is how much do areas providing ecosystem services overlap with indigenous peoples and local communities lands? I decided to investigate this question with two objectives. The first is just looking at whether there's overlap between ecosystem services and indigenous peoples lands. The second looks a little closer at IPLC rights, seeing if there's a difference between the extent of IPLC rights in an area such as partial rights, like access and use, or full rights all the way up to management and exclusion of people from an area, and whether that impacts the performance level in terms of ecosystem services. So whether the ecosystem services are lower or higher in that area as a result of rights differences. The overall goal was to explore the relationship between IPLC's lands and ecosystem services management, looking at this relationship spatially. So for my methods, over the summer, I devoted my time to data collection for Africa to fill a data gap identified by Conservation International for IPLC lands in that area. I'm now working on investigating objective one, which is overlaying the IPLC and ecosystem service layers to see where overlap exists. I'm particularly interested in looking at where high performing ecosystem service areas are in relation to IPLC lands. Next, I'll be doing a deeper dive, as I mentioned, into looking at uh, partial versus full rights. And I'll be focusing on Africa since I'm more familiar with that as a result of my data collection over the summer. I'll be creating maps to visualize these different overlays. And if there's time running through the school tasks, to look at that relationship between IPLC lands and ecosystem services. So this is my um, map for my preliminary results for objective one. Um, I wanna first make a note that this is draft data. So please do not take photos or screenshot or otherwise share 
this data, but um, so this is showing overall overlap between IPLC lands and ecosystem services. In yellow on the screen, you can see IPLC held lands. And in dark purple, you can see the higher value ecosystem services areas. And in white are the lower value ecosystem services layers. The gray countries indicate areas where we do not currently have IPLC data and Conservation International's data set. This doesn't mean the data doesn't exist or the IPLCs do not have lands in these areas. It simply means that we either couldn't get the data for that area, um, the data that we found for that area doesn't meet the requirements for Conservation International's data set, or we just need more research for that country to determine where the IPLC lands are. So the interesting thing we're looking at right now with this first overlay is that there's more overlap with lower value ecosystem services areas than we expected. My advisors and I currently have several discussion points as to why this might be. The main one being the nature of the ecosystem services model we used. It's a combination of about 12 different services. So the services that were selected for that model may be impacting what's considered high value versus low value. It's really dependent on how the model is made, especially considering that the model incorporates population density and IPLC areas are typically in areas that are lower population density. Some other things we're considering are that in some countries, IPLCs may have been pushed off of their traditional lands onto lands that are more unproductive, as well as different countries just having different history and laws related to IPLCs. Overall, after doing this first analysis, we'd like to dig deeper to better understand this relationship and connect what we're seeing to known information about IPLC lands and their history. So our next steps, as I said, are to look more at this first analysis, specifically by breaking apart the ecosystem services data set to look at individual services that we know are very important on IPLC lands and see if we see um, more of the relationships we hypothesized in those ways. We'll also move into the second objective and do the case study in Africa to look at the relationship between the amount of rights IPLCs have in the area and the performance of ecosystem services. All of our results and discussions will be incorporated into a paper. Um, overall, these results are very significant because it's filling a gap about the relationship between IPLCs and ecosystem services. Knowing information about this is very helpful for countries in terms of land management, and it's very important for IPLCs in terms of negotiating and advocating for their rights. On a conservation and national level, it's important for developing policy positions, as well as getting insights from the policy team about their thoughts on this analysis and filling data gaps for the IPLC layer, like I discussed with my collection for Africa. Um, overall, it has been an absolute pleasure to generate evidence in an area where knowledge is currently lacking in the field. So lastly, I want to thank Conservation International, particularly my advisors, Pam and Sushma, for all of their support throughout all of this, and my advisors at Women Mary, particularly Rob Rose, for their support and guidance. And thanks to you all for listening. And I will now turn it over to one of my advisors from Con Conservation International, Pam Collins, for a reflection. Testing, 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 testing. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes? Fabulous. Hi, everybody. My name is Pamela Collins. I'm a science, scientist at Conservation International based in Washington, D.C., with offices in 30 countries around the world. Um, my colleague Susma, yeah, Susma Shrestha and I have been working with Christina for almost a year now on this project, and we have been very impressed with the clarity and the precision of her thinking, with her enthusiasm, how hardworking and eminently competent she is and how personable she is. So it's really been a pleasure working with her. Um, and we're looking forward to finishing out the year with her. The work that you've seen presented today has a few analytical steps, a few you know, further steps that we're gonna be working on together. And ultimately it will culminate in a, a manuscript submission to an academic journal in partnership with our research collaborators at King's College London. Um, the results are going to be used within the policy division at Conservation International to, to uh, inform some of the guidance that that team is providing to the Convention on Biological Diversity negotiations that are currently ongoing, which have ecosystem services and Indigenous people and local communities rights as high priorities right alongside biodiversity. So it's been great, and we're looking forward to uh, everything that we have left to do and uh, continuing to work with Christina. So thank you all very much. Next up, we have Marion.
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mariam and this afternoon I'm going to be taking you to the Caribbean to learn more about sea level rise and how it's destroying <coughs> seagrass habitat and what we can do to help. So sea level rise is a threat in coastal areas, um, not only to biodiversity, but also to people. And to bring this closer to home, uh, the Hampton Road area um, right next door is actually the second largest population center in the country um, at most risk for sea level rise. Um, and um, the sea level rises about one inch every year. Um, and the WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society uh, Mesoamerica program recognizes this, and they're in the early stages of developing a marine conservation program in the Caribbean. Um, and they are in the process of developing this program. And um, they basically um, realized that sea level rise, because um, the Caribbean has um, <coughs> biodiversity and ecosystem services, it's crucial to begin um, looking at sea level rise and how it affects different organisms there. And they identified seagrasses as a um, crucial uh, species to begin restoring. But why seagrasses? So seagrasses are marine plants found in coastal areas. And they have uh, they play significant roles in um, their environment in terms of uh, economic and ecological roles. Um, so, um, in their environments, they provide habitats, nursery food for marine organisms. But they also um, their economic value is seen in the industries they support, like commercial fishing and wildlife tourism. And the idea here is we can't necessarily prevent sea level rise, but we have to do what we can. Uh, to live with it. And so uh, the objectives really of this project is to see what areas um, or identify areas uh, where seagrass habitat occurs and how that will be lost over time and what we can do to prevent that in the first place. So this is where I come in. I worked with the WCS um, to build a tool using ArcGIS Pro to identify <coughs> areas where seagrass habitat will be lost and the most suitable habitat in the future, um, uh, depending on the various sea level rise scenarios. So we focused primarily in Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Cuba, with the guiding objectives of what is the current distribution of seagrass habitat now, what will be suitable habitat in the future, how much of that habitat will be lost in the future. And then also we looked at um, evaluating how useful current marine protected areas are as designed by regional programs. So the general methods were collecting the data, which took the majority <laughs> of the summer. Um, and then we delineated land that will be underwater according to various sea level rise scenarios. And then we adjusted the bathymetry, which is the sea depth, so that water is higher everywhere. And then finally, just running some statistics to determine the actual percentage of habitat lost and also how useful um, current marine protected areas are. So the CFR <laughs> scenarios that we used um, were from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association. And we chose these particular scenarios because um, they most align with our carbon footprint. So this is a sample map that shows the worst possible scenario with the two meter sea level rise <laughs> given high carbon emissions. And in orange, that's land that will be underwater. And the light blue is the current seagrass distribution. So the overlap indicates two things. One, the land itself underwater will be um, shallow waters. So that could be suitable habitat. But at the same time, um, water is deeper everywhere, which means that seagrasses, since they can't survive um, in those deeper waters, those are no longer um, viable habitat. And this is an image of the current marine protected areas in Belize in pink, and the light blue is also seagrasses. So I'm still running the analysis, but this just shows that um, current marine protected areas are not as useful right now. So if we don't change how they are right now, then they're not gonna be as useful in the future for seagrasses. So those were a few of the early findings, but the biggest takeaway here is that um, seagrass habitat will be lost over time. Um, and this is a section of Cuba where red is one meter of land above water and blue is two meters of land above water. So we can see that 
in this section of Cuba alone, a lot of land will be underwater. And if you think about how seagrasses are found along the coast, that means that um, there is a significant portion of habitat that will be lost. But what does this mean for WCS? Basically, it is in their best interest to act now and to develop the best restoration practices possible so that um, seagrasses stay resilient to the predicted change of uh, sea level over time. And currently, there are restoration programs in Australia, New Zealand, the UK, and even in Florida. And UVA also produced plenty of studies showing and demonstrating different restoration practices. And this project overall kind of sets the precedent for finding um, other organisms affected by sea level rise and trying to keep the world's best habitat as well. So I do want to extend um, my utmost gratitude to my conservation partner, Christian Variantes from WCS, and also to Robert Rose and Matthias Loy, and also Molly Mitchell from DIMS, who gave me um, insight as to what sea level rise is. Um, so at this time, I'd like to welcome Christian if he's here. Uh, to provide a brief uh, thank you, Mariam. Yes, I'm here. Can everybody hear me? With one yes, would be okay. Hopefully, you can hear me. Okay, with some delay. Yeah, I, I'm. I really want to thank uh, Williams and Mary, the IAC, and also especially Mariam uh, for this project. Um, we're just trying to figure out how to be, you know. Uh, advantage uh, get, getting ahead of what is going to happen uh, instead of uh, trying to complain of, of what we are protecting right now or what, how can we protect the seagrasses the best way we're just trying to get ahead of the game and, and try to figure out what's going to happen i mean climate change is here um wcs is right now representing uh, mesoamerica in, in the cop trying to figure out exactly how can we stop it but i mean most of the most likely means that uh what marianne actually did is just going to guide or conservation efforts and of uh, marine protected areas efforts in the next probably 20, 30 years. And the most of us points to the, we need adaptive management. We need to be flexible and change where the marine protected areas are at this point and at some point in the future. So thanks a lot, Mariam, and thanks a lot for um, and Mary for the opportunity to work with, uh, with one of your students. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Next up, we have Neil Simpson. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil Simpson. I am a senior here at William & Mary, and my project was remote sensing as a tool to understand deforestation in Ecuador. Uh, my partners and mentors were Robert Rose with the IIC, uh, Professor Jordan Carubian and his ecology lab at Tulane University, and FK Ecuador, especially Margarita Becaro, who is the executive director. Uh, so the conservation challenge that I was faced with is deforestation in Ecuador and particularly the tropical rainforests. Uh, since 1970, uh, over 30% of Ecuador's rainforests have been cut down. Uh, this is due to a combination of factors, but in the region that I was working with in the Choco rainforest, uh, it had a lot to do with socioeconomic activity and the expansion of agriculture and urban development in the region. Uh, this kind of deforestation threatens bi biodiversity and natural resources uh, because a lot of indigenous peoples require or uh, rely on a lot of natural resources that come from the biodiversity of these ecosystems, as well as carbon cycling. Uh, we know that tropical rainforests are some of our best defenses against climate change and deforestation kind of poses a scary threat to that. Um, so the goal of this project was to balance the community's socioeconomic needs, uh, as well as meeting the conservation goals that are required to protect the forests. Uh, so remote sensing is essentially the art and science of detecting geographic data when you can't actually go to that place. So in my example, I was using satellite imagery to map and create a data set and map of the region. Uh, however, it's especially difficult in a rainforest because a lot of the images you'll have a really high percentage of cloud cover, uh, variations in land cover that essentially look the same uh, at a high level, and then the difficulty to actually go out <coughs> the rainforest and ground truth so we know what we think is something is in fact that thing. Um, so I decided to create a land use land cover map which uh, combines the land cover, so what type of vegetation or uh, development is on the land and combines that with land use. So how is it actually being used 
by the people and ecosystems that are on it. Uh, so FCA Ecuador manages an existing reserve in the Chocola Rainforest, which is in northwestern Ecuador. Uh, they work very closely with the Caribbean Lab, which uh, not only studies biodiversity, but promotes biodiversity and conservation uh, through their research, which connects uh, particularly forest health uh, with bolstering local livelihoods and encouraging people to live uh, in uh, respect to the rainforest. Uh, so in order to expand their existing reserve, which they plan to do in the next few years, uh, they needed a map of the surrounding region to understand where deforestation was happening and how fast it was happening. So the project objectives were in the spring, I started researching and outlining a re remote sensing methodology to create the land for <laughs> as well as got some background research on the biodiversity of the area, as well as the people that live there. Uh, create classified maps of the imagery that I was able to download from the past three years uh, from imagery, and then communicate the purpose of these maps uh, to people in the communities, as well as uh, anyone interested in FCAT's work, uh, as well as use these maps for further GIS analysis and uh, use them to promote further conservation knowledge. Uh, so basically where I started, as you can see, this is a uh, example of the imagery that I was using. As you can see, I had to stitch two images together to get the full map, uh, but they wanted about 80 kilometers squared of the area surrounding the reserve to be mapped. And the goal is to connect uh, Bilsa, which is in pink in the left corner, uh, up to that lake that you see in the top right, uh, to create a forest corridor that would connect all of these habitats and allow animals to travel between, allow for forests to grow in between, and create a really important kind of column for biodiversity. Uh, so as I said, my methods were to one, download imagery and decide on my categories of land cover, uh, use an object-oriented classification to create my maps, uh, assess for accuracy and repeat <coughs> if it was necessary. It was definitely necessary. And I made some kind of inaccurate maps at the first start. So it was a fun learning process. And then go on to calculate the change in between the maps to estimate deforestation over the three year period. Uh, so these are the maps that I made. Uh, one difficulty that we had, as I mentioned, rainforests tend to have cloud covers. So these are, believe it or not, the best images that I could find, which had less than 5% cloud cover. Um, but yeah, as you can see, this was able to create successful maps and they had an average accuracy of 88%, which was really exciting. Cool, so the results that I found was that there was a net loss of 1.3% of the forest in the first year and about 0.8% in the second year. Uh, that net loss being that in some areas we saw the forest expand, in some areas we saw it uh, lose. So overall, there was just a little bit of loss. Um, but in particular, 83.45% of the forest that was lost was lost to agriculture, indicating that this agricultural expansion could be a really significant driver uh, based on the work that I did with FCAT and the conversations that we had. Uh, it could be driven by cattle herding, which is becoming a lot more prevalent in the region and is a really important socioeconomic activity. <coughs> this also gives us the potential for community-based land planning and working within the communities in the study area to plan for both uh, socioeconomic growth and forest protection. So the next steps that we're going to go from here are analyze deforestation and landscape change, uh, which I've been working on, and FCAT is going to be able to use these maps for further GIS analysis. Um, FCAT will then be able to use these to not only understand we, where deforestation is happening, but eventually connect their reserve and kind of make uh, the smartest decision to where the what plot of land they should actually buy and where it will be. Uh, most relevant. And then they're going to continue outreach efforts and expand and promote sustainable economic activity uh, through an ecotourism plan, which Madeline's going to be talking about. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Dale. Um, and next up, uh, we have Madeline Bernal. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Madeline. I'm a senior at the college majoring in environmental policy and business analytics. And this year, I had the pleasure to partner with FCAT Ecuador and my research advisor, Graham Henshaw, to produce a sustainable <laughs> business model. And this was really cool because I was able to provide um, my coursework that I learned in the classroom and then combine it with my passion for the environment. 
Okay, cool. So you're probably wondering what's well, FGA. Well, Neil already touched a lot on that. So that was really cool of him, but what is the business model? What am I doing? Um, so FCAT is located in the northwestern portion of Ecuador within the Chocho Forest. And they're already 90% deforested because the locals lack economic alternatives and usually use this land for cattle production or cocoa. So they came to Weimar with this issue and they wanted to find an alternative livelihood or a solution to help mitigate this. And through working with them last semester, I thought of a lot of different things, looking at sustainable vanilla, sustainable um, fishing, employing the locals and ecotourism. And then we finally landed on ecotourism, but we wanted to rename it mission-centric visitation. So what is that? When I think of ecotourism, I think of any plain Jane going to the Grand Canyon. This is a little bit different because these are visitors who are really invested in forest ecology and conservation. So we wanted to welcome individuals who are passionate and also want to immerse themselves within the Ecuadorian community. So the idea is that FCAT would host these individuals and partner them with like locals within the area to do research. This past summer, I developed a business model using interviews, surveys, and online ecological research and um, research on ecotourism and the Ecuadorian community. And it's really important that I was able to use interviews and surveys to produce this business model because this is about a service and forming connections. So I wanted to hear possible um, perspectives from customers and past visitors. So if you're going to look up here, we're really going to focus on the customer segments. This is people who are going to be visiting FCAT. These are established researchers within the forest ecology um, area. The university study abroad individuals like us who want to visit and also high school students. And the channels are how are you going to reach these customer segments. This would be through department heads, PhD programs with ecology, headmasters, and the customer relationship is the relationship that the customers will form with FCAT. And I found the biggest priority was safety and accessibility, because when you're bringing 30, 18 year olds into um, another country, they want to feel safe and comfortable there. So here you're going to see a lot of things. So we're going to look at the value proposition is the most important part, but also where you see the cost structure, the annual operating budget of 100,000, and the revenue streams are supposed to cover this cost structure. So the value proposition is what does FCAT value? Um, <laughs> and bring that difference himself from other research stations, other NGOs, and other study abroad partners. And I was able to use this with past surveys from people who had visited this past summer. It was really cool because everyone enjoyed their experience at FCAT and 100% of them would go back. They called the people who worked there FCATers and they said they loved them all and they also really appreciated the hands-on working experience. They were able to go outside and test and look at birds and do all of that outside and then step two feet back inside into the lab and test it all. And over here, you're gonna see a lot of things too. Um, so we're gonna look at the key resources. The key resources are the resources needed to bring the value proposition, what I just talked about. This is what FCAT offers that we are looking for. So the main thing is accessibility to an intact forest. We're not gonna be able to have visitors if we don't have a forest nearby to look at. And also we have on-site cooks and sleeping arrangements at the station that makes it easier and also just allows students to really get immersed in the culture and also studying and so they can really experience this without focusing on like traveling and stuff. So they're right in the middle of this all. And the key activities are what we're gonna do to bring value. This would be marketing, which I'm kind of doing right now. And also approval with study abroad offices and constant communication with individuals and partners. <laughs> The key partnerships are really the individuals involved in this whole process, and that would be the channels, the community members, and students and researchers. Okay, uh, so the next steps is what I'm doing this semester. So this semester, I'm developing a marketing splash page, kind of trying to validate this with um, the channels and customer segments. So the idea is I would kind of send this link to possible customers and channels and I would look at the data analytics of who visits this website and who subscribes to this content. It's kind of cool because I've never designed a website. I feel really tech savvy, but I'm excited to show everyone in the IAC later on. And hopefully this will really bring lasting impact to the FCAT community and also the local Ecuadorian community as well. Um, I wanted to thank my partners and also Graham Henshaw and also all these pictures were from the station as well. So that's why they all really pretty. Um, we wanted to also welcome Margarita to speak right now. She's on Zoom. 
Hello, um, can you see me there? Yep. yep. <clears throat> okay, so well, it's very nice to meet you all. I'm not going to be too long, so you won't get bored or fall asleep. <laughs> so I'm um, here in Ecuador, and I'm really thankful for Madeline and Neil. Um, and I can speak for both of them. They have done an amazing job, and it's great to have their support. Um, I'm just going to talk a bit about Madeline and her work uh, and a bit about us. So we're an NGO from Ecuador. And we rely strongly in, in grants. And you know that uh, money for uh, conservation is not a lot and there's a lot of competition to get that money. So uh, we, we've always thought of alternative ways to get some income. So we built a station in 2019 and we have received groups from Tulane University, a few students from UC Davis, but through Madeline and her help and her commitment, uh, we really wanna see what's the best way to reach um, the biggest amount of people to do to for them to come to the station and then we can use those unrestricted funds to keep on doing our community engaged research so her contribution to conservation and to the well-being of local people here in the one of the parts in the world is, is great so I want to thank Madeline for that if you give me a few seconds I would like to make a meal uh, and to make him think that he's also doing a big contribution to real conservation all the way from the US because he's gonna help us find which places have a priority uh, to be bought and um, to, to take care and preserve whatever uh, threatened species live there. Uh, he will also let us know with his study what is the um, what are the different uses of the land there and then we can also come up with different uh, sustainable economic activities and maybe develop ecotourism in the area. So thank you to both of you. EFCAT is really uh, grateful for your job and your commitment and, and thank you all for having me here. Thank you, Margarita, for joining all the way from Ecuador. And also thank you, Professor Jordan Caribbean for joining us and for all of your support. Um, our final presentation um, was given by three uh, <laughs> students who worked as an inter interdisciplinary team on a project. Um, Eileen Din is joining here in person. Um, Melissa Okuno will be joining us from Washington, D.C. And Grace Breitenbeck will uh, send us a video because she's currently on her way to Antarctica. Uh, to do some research. So we have this very spread out team that has been working closely together to present an incredible project on Highland. So thank you, Ellie. Okay, but it's embedded. Um, so hi, I'm Eileen Den. Um, thank you, Erica, for that introduction. Um, I will just jump right into it. So when we started developing this proposal in January, we all had to consider what we felt was the characteristics that made William and Mary quintessentially William and Mary. And we all concluded that it was this ability to take what you learn in the classroom and apply it in the field. And so with that in mind, we kind of, we kind of crafted this proposal with experiential education and experiential learning right at the center of it. So as you can see by these goals, which were extracted from the recently published Vision 2026 Strategic Planning, our proposal is aiming to take these ideas and take these goals and expand upon them and extend our reach to Charlottesville and globally as well. So a little bit of background on Highland. It was a formal, the former plantation of US President James Monroe and it neighbors Thomas Jefferson's Monticello in Charlottesville. So it represents this really tragic and complex history that we are you know, embedded in our nation. And one of the things that makes the property and all of those who work there really special right now is that they're really trying to take the history and understand every component of it. And director Sarah Bon Harper, who we've worked really closely with, has um, formed a really close administrative relationship with the Council of Descendant Advisors, which is comprised of descendants of those enslaved at Highland. And they have practiced this shared authority of the property that's aiming to tell this 
inclusive history, as you can see on the slide. And, you know, we, as again, we've been crafting this proposal, we've really had to take in, take their input into account because it's really important to understand um, all that comes with the property and all of the stories that are left to uncover. With these goals in mind, we are aiming to formally recognize Highland as an interdisciplinary field station. So what that means is that it's we want it to be somewhere where faculty and students can go and engage in experiential learning of all kinds. Um, we believe that given Highland's existing operations related to social justice, as we just saw in the previous slide, as well as environmental sustainability and conservation, it is really a perfect setting for students to be able to come and engage in projects that are already happening, but also conduct their own research um, and participate in class settings on the property as well. Um, envision it to be this living laboratory and this hub of learning and a place where people can be excited to go and participate in collaborative and relevant projects um, in Charlottesville. So. Um, as you can see up here, these are our main project objectives, but overall, we really just want to recognize the importance of Highland as, again, a place where learning can happen of all kinds, and it can be a training site for field conservation and firsthand experience in real projects with external partners, as we've all gotten to like have through this research um, program this past year. It's an opportunity to further engage in that. So by, by promoting these objectives, we can create this model for conservation and experiential learning that can apply to William and Mary, the rest of Virginia and beyond as well. So now we are going to watch a video by Grace Breitenbach, who like Erica mentioned, is in Antarctica. So okay. Uh, <laughs> so Grace's Grace's video is going to touch on different opportunities she has identified related to experiential education and how we can incorporate that into various curricula. Okay. Can you hear? Can you can hear? Can you hear? Sure. You can have to change the audio source in Zoom. So I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah. But you selected the microphone. You selected the microphone, not the speaker. Speaker with the button option. You selected the no, the next yes. level. Oh, here. Oh, yeah. The three dots on the board. Oh, boy. No, yeah. I mean, when you click, you click the microphone. Oh, yeah, you just and Sure. If it's this, it should work. Yeah, no. go, go to where it says more on the three dots. On top of the yeah. It should yeah. be like computer sound somewhere. Your sound. Your sound. Your sound. Good job with public education. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Okay, Hello. start My over. Name I'm Miss Grace Breitenbeck, and I'm a senior majoring in biology and minoring in history here at William and Mary. My section of our proposal is focused on education. Highland already does a great job with public education and outreach. Dr. Sarah von Harper has led Highland in emphasizing the multi-story history of the property. 
My section of the proposal hopes to outline ways in which we can better connect the William & Mary community with Highland's current educational programs and find new and innovative ways to build on that foundation while also meeting the university's goals. This can be accomplished through the following initiatives. One, the development of new call designated courses centered around Highland. Expanding the call curriculum to encompass Highland would allow students to become familiar with Highland as a place and a resource, while also demonstrating the importance of why William & Mary owns and operates a former plantation. By embracing and expanding student engagement with Highland, William & Mary can model the importance of active and honest engagement with difficult histories. Two, the integration of Highland into current courses and research. This is an easy way to increase student awareness of an interest in Highland without requiring many resources from the university. It is a great first step towards the ultimate goal of developing Highland into an integral part of the William & Mary experience. Three, the integration of Highland into new student orientation programming. Introducing students to Highland early on in their William & Mary career is extremely important for several reasons. One, students need to understand why William & Mary engages with a former plantation. And two, students need to be familiarized with all of William & Mary resources and opportunities, even those not on the main campus, in order to make the most of their experience at the college. Four, utilizing Highland to help expand William & Mary's public history and archeology span program. This will give students the opportunity to work in a different region of Virginia and encounter different artifacts and working conditions to the other field schools currently offered by William & Mary, which focus on colonial history. Five, utilizing Highland as a site for career exploration and preparation. Highland is a leader in public history and education. It is also located in a vibrant community full of William & Mary alumni. We suggest hosting gatherings with local alumni and current students to encourage career mentoring and exploration. This would not only help William & Mary prepare students for their future careers, but would also enhance alumni engagement with the university. Six, expanding alumni opportunities through Highland. This would work towards meeting William & Mary's goal to strengthen alumni relations and enhance lifelong learning opportunities while also demonstrating the value of William & Mary beyond just the traditional four-year undergraduate experience. Highland already offers two or more alumni service days each year and has offered some alumni programming. These programs have been successful thus far and should be expanded to capitalize on alumni interest, including from regions outside of the Charlottesville chapter. Seven, forging connections between William and Mary and local K-12 students through Highland. Students studying education could develop curricula and workshops for local K-12 students that focus on Highland, its history, and its current work. These could be tailored to meet the needs and standards of learning for a particular grade level. This would give William & Mary students the opportunity to actively engage with students, learn to apply their knowledge through teaching, and discover more about Highland in the process. It would also increase local engagement with Highland while increasing familiarity with William & Mary among prospective students and parents. And finally, all of these initiatives can fall under the umbrella of an interdisciplinary field station at Highland. The field station is the ultimate suggestion of our proposal. This field station would be a cooperative effort between all interested departments and would help encourage interactions between students and faculty from different disciplines. It would highlight the interconnectedness between all ideas and paths of study while enhancing research and educational opportunities. Okay, so you know, as Grace talked about, the interdisciplinary field station is obviously our ultimate goal with this project. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how this can relate to goals related to sustainability and conservation. So 
on the property already. It's it's a gorgeous property with 500 acres of land and it's in Charlottesville. There's hills, there's mountains, there's trees. It's really gorgeous. And so on the property, there's a bunch of different projects going on that are related to nature and sustainability and conservation as well. So those can range from an operational cattle farm to extensive archaeological research, prolific apiaries, a stream buffer repair project, and just day-to-day -day environmental maintenance. So there's many different groups and individuals that spend a lot of time at Highland working with the environment and enjoying the nature surrounding them. And we see this as something that students can get involved in all of these projects, but we can also bring our own expertise and start some new, some new ventures, whether that's through research, conducting their own research, or engaging in new business ventures. Um, there's just a lot of different opportunities and chances that Ireland presents that are really unique. So, oh, this, <laughs> these are just some pictures that demonstrate the ways in which Highland is a living laboratory. Um, kind of above in the middle, those are some of the real cattle that are on the property. You can see the apiaries from the bee project going on. And in the top left corner, that's Sarah. Owen Harper, who's the executive director, standing above some of her archaeological research that she's been conducting over the years. So as we consider all of our future goals with this, project, we want to make sure that we're doing it all in a way that has a very limited impact on the environment. And we see Highland as a chance to kind of make it a model for sustainable living and allow students to imagine what they could look like. Um, one of the things I've been working on, and I know we've talked a little about tourism and other projects today, but I've been thinking about a way to establish some kind of sustainable housing options that could boost ecotourism by following sort of a glamping model, but also provide housing for students and faculty when they're conducting research on the property. And we kind of just see this as a way, as just an idea for how we can further engage in the property and it also provides the potential to pilot new academic programs related to ecotourism or agriculture, uh, sorry, regenerative hospitality, um, which is kind of an emerging field about sustainable living. So all in all, Highland offers a lot of cool opportunities to engage in environmental research and conservation efforts, whether they are already happening on the property or haven't even been thought of yet. And we just want to recognize this property as a resource and create ultimately a foundation for students to utilize it as such. Um, and so now Melissa McCuna is gonna talk about her ideas for social justice on the property. <coughs> and um, she's on Zoom. So <coughs> if you're out there, you can go ahead. Hello, everyone. Apologies that I can't be on video. My computer has decided to have technical problems, so it's just audio today. But my name is Melissa McKenna. Thank you, Eileen, for the introduction. And I am in charge of the environmental and social justice portion of our proposal. For the section, I work to formulate objectives that would fulfill William and Mary's already mentioned goals, the DEI goals, while encouraging student collaboration with Highland and the larger Albemarle County and Charlottesville city communities. Next slide, please. For this proposal, it was really important for me to define environmental justice early in the process. The proposal explored environmental justice as a subset of social justice with particular focus on the land and its surrounding inhabitants. This worked well for investigating opportunities for initiatives at Highland since the land has had such a great impact on the Charlottesville landscape and its history. With the focus on the land and people, I took a two-pronged approach for determining how I wanted this section to impact people, public engagement and public provision. With public engagement, I wanted to make sure that the initiatives provided space for the William and Mary community 
and Highland's surrounding community to engage more with the property and its history and its natural resources. With public provision, I aimed for initiatives that would give the public a resource, a takeaway, whether educational or tangible, that they could have for their own use. Next slide, please. With all of that in mind, five objectives were developed. The first, establish firm administrative relationships between the Council of Descendant Advisors, Highland, and William and Mary's larger community. The Council has administrative ties to Highland and the William and Mary administration, but there isn't as much communication between the Council and students and faculty. So the goal would be to open windows for collaboration and conversation between these groups. The next would be to utilize Highland's position as a public property to facilitate socially beneficial connections and education. Highland is very public facing and accessible, so it'd be optimal to use that already existing avenues of access to forge more connections with students, other universities and local groups in its surrounding community to Highland. The third would be to fulfill a role in reparations for William & Mary's ties with slavery with the passing of HB 1980 in the Virginia House and its current debate in the Virginia Senate, there's a need for colonial colleges like ourselves to give reparations back to descendant communities. Highland's own history with slavery means that it's a good place for giving reparations in a variety of ways, whether that be educationally and financially or through other resources. The fourth objective would be to collaborate with UVA's sustainability programs to assist local marginalized communities. The University of Virginia has a food lab at Morven, their own historic property. Charlottesville has a documented history of food insecurity, so Highland and Morven can collaborate on agriculture initiatives. The last would be to connect environmental sustainability, historical research, and social justice meaningfully and accessibly. This would be creating spaces for conversation and collaboration about social, environmental, and historical justice for students, Highland, and its surrounding community. Next slide, please. So through that, I established five initiatives. The first is to establish Highland as a land trust with the Council of Descendant Advisors as the trustees. This is important in conversations of collective land ownership and would build off of the existing relationship between the Council of Descendant Advisors, and Director Bon Harper, and the William & Mary administration. The next would be to establish a land trust, I'm sorry, to establish a land trail, I had it wrong in my notes, between Morven and Highland. This trail would provide space for the public to visit and learn more about the property and appreciate its natural resources. While there would also be educational plaques along the trail, so visitors could learn more about the shared history of the two properties, their former inhabitants, and how they have made their impact on the larger Charlottesville City, Albemarle County area. The next would be agriculture education programs. This could be a collaborative effort between Highland staff and other local groups in the area working on food justice, food systems, and agriculture to teach people about farming independently and other aspects of establishing yourself within a food system. This could make participating in food systems and access to food more equitable and increase information and education on how to get involved in your local food systems. The next would be community-led agriculture. This builds off of the third initiative as there are many groups in Albemarle County and Charlottesville already doing work in food justice, whether that be through agriculture education, agriculture itself or food banks. And so, this would be Highlands giving its land as like a physical space for already established organizations to come grow and distribute food. The last initiative would be to support the work of a racial equity center as established by the Council of the Senate Advisors. There are pilot programs starting this fall. So the goal would be for students and faculty to support their efforts via research, advocacy, and engaging in necessary conversations about social and environmental justice. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, we are in the process of finalizing our proposal, which will then be made available to the William and Mary administration, as well as 
all of its schools and departments so that we can really gather all of their feedback and make headway on some of our ideas. Um, in the next, uh, you know, future, as we look to take action, we want to address logistical questions, including accommodation, um, transportation, etc. But overall, we just want to support new ideas coming in and emphasize the fact that this is a very dynamic project and our broadest, broadest goal is just that we want to get people really excited about Highland and all that it has to offer. Um, so we, through our conversations with stakeholders so far, we've had some success already, including classes that are going to be offered um, using Highland as a focal point next semester in the spring, as well as another round of um, another project sponsored by the IIC for next year. And these are this is really exciting because it's nice to know that the ball is going to keep rolling and get you know more and more people are going to start knowing about Highland and knowing what an exciting opportunity it is to get involved. So in conclusion, we envision Highland to be a hub for learning and somewhere where students feel empowered to explore their ideas, encouraged to collaborate and excited to discover. And we want this field station to be somewhere where students and faculty can really just come together and explore all of their ideas while collaborating both with each other and with the external partners that Highland already has, as well as, you know, we'll will meet in the future. Um, so, you know, bringing together this idea of experiential learning, especially in the fields of social and environmental justice is really important in a time like right now. And being a part of this project for me has been really exciting and very special. And so I know Melissa, Grace and I wanna give a special thanks to Erica and Dan and Sarah, as well as all of our stakeholders that have been a part of this process. So. Thank you for listening. Um, we welcome any feedback and questions you may have. Thank you. It's almost the end of time, but I did want to give uh, Highland Director Sarah Van Hopper a chance to quickly reflect on the implications of this proposal, and then we'll wrap it up. So Sarah. Well, thank you. Um, first, congratulations to Melissa, Eileen, and Grace, and thank you to the IIC, and especially to you, Erica, and to faculty mentor, Dan Crystal. Um, Highland, its place in the university and its role in the community, including its role to descendant stakeholders and the state of its physical environment are all tied up in the property's complex history as a slaveholding agricultural plantation. And Highland has been faced with potential threats, including changing land use and funding, funding sources. The integrative work by this team of students, as you've seen, goes beyond the bounds of conservation to highlight the educational value of the property and to chart a course for continued conversations of land justice and varied educational projects, as well as biodiversity projects, such as an invasive species control stream bank repair effort that we are launching next week. And this semester's work helps support an ecosystem of cultural and environmental repair that I feel is really important and has been well served by these three students. So thank you. Sarah, uh, so thanks. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, this has been a year long effort led by these amazing 16 undergraduate students who we're so proud of. Um, we encourage you all, you're all part of the IIC network, but we encourage you all to stay engaged. The best way to do that is to sign up for the IIC's listserv, visit our website um, and come visit us at the IIC house. We have an upcoming event actually next Thursday, November 4th. Um, it's a Zoom event from 12 to one, uh, focused on the <coughs> road building in, on indigenous communities in Forest and Honduras. So please check out the IIC website to register for that event next week. And to conclude, I would like to thank the conservation partners who have provided Tons of time and energy and support for these students working on these projects and for piloting this collaborative project or this collaborative program this year with the IIC. This is the first time that we've run it and it's gone incredibly well because we have such dedicated conservation partners. I'd also like to thank the faculty mentors who spent a lot of time and energy as well supporting students with these applied projects. Um, without your insight and expertise, this would not be possible. And it really has helped us think about how to match William Mary expertise with the needs of um, external conservation partners to help collaboratively advance 
uh, integrated approaches to conservation. I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues in the IIC, as well as our advisory board, Student Leadership Council, and steering committee members. And most importantly, I'd like to thank the 16 students uh, for all the amazing work that you've done. You should be very proud of the work that you've done. You really helped us figure out what this program looks like. And you've really set the bar high for what William & Mary students can do to really help advance conservation. Um, you should be very proud of yourself. We are very proud of you, and we thank you for all your work. So thank you all, and we'll have a few minutes for in-person questions here as you head out. And for our Zoom audience, thank you for joining us. This will be recorded presentation will be up on the YouTube, IIC's YouTube channel. So thank you for joining us.